Thank you very much indeed, Peter, for the lovely ministry and the gospel meeting tonight. And thanks again to your brother, George, your pastor, for inviting me along uh, this evening. It's a joy to renew fellowship with him and some of the folks that I know down here in Kilkeel. We're coming to Luke's Gospel, please. Luke's Gospel, chapter 12. And I want to speak tonight about uh, the foolish farmer. And sometimes he's called a rich farmer, and he was a rich farmer, but God calls him a fool. And I want to read, let's read verse 16, Luke chapter 12. And before we read the parable, I want to just look why the Lord Jesus told the parable in the first place, because when the Lord Jesus does something, he always has a very good reason for doing it. And when he gives a parable, he always has a good reason for giving it. And let's look at the first verse here of the parable. First of all, Luke chapter 12 and verse 16. If you haven't a Bible with you, just listen to the Word of God. This will be the most important thing said tonight is what we read from God's Word. Luke 16, or sorry, Luke chapter 12 and verse 16. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. Now, we want to notice why the Lord Jesus told that parable. He's telling the parable of this man who is done well in his business. His farm has done quite well. It has brought forth plentifully. He maybe sowed at the right time. He maybe put the right fertilizer on, or maybe the weather was just right. But whatever it was, things were going rosy for this farmer. Now, you turn back to chapter 12 and verse 1. And I want you to notice what's going on in chapter 12 and verse 1, because it says in verse 1, in the meantime, there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another. And he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, and the Lord Jesus has this crowd of people around him. You could see the meeting. Let's call it a meeting. And there's a bigger crowd than there is here tonight. It's an innumerable multitude of people, a big crowd of people, and you couldn't put a number on it. In the Bible, when they were feeding the 5,000, they were able to put a number on 5,000, but they're not able to put a number in this meeting, so there must have been more than 5,000. And the Lord Jesus is in the meeting, and the Lord Jesus is speaking, and nobody ever spoke like him. Remember what it says in John chapter 7 and verse 46? It says, never man spake like this man. And here's this meeting, and here's the Lord Jesus in the meeting. And the Lord Jesus is preaching the word, and no doubt he's telling people about their need of salvation. Now look what happens. Look at verse 13. And one of the company, and our attention's going from the meeting now to the man. There's one single man in this meeting, and he's got something on his mind. It says, And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. There's a man in the meeting, and the only thing in his mind is half of the inheritance that his brother got. His father has died. And you see, I believe that the man who died, that's the man the Lord Jesus is talking about in the parable. A farmer has died, and he's left an inheritance, and I assume the older son has put his hands on it, and he said, well, I'm taking the whole farm, and I'm, I'm taking the barns, and I'm taking the tractors, and I'm, I'm taking everything else, I'm taking all the money, uh, and my young brother, well, he can go and get stuffed as far as I'm concerned. And this young brother's in the meeting, and the Lord Jesus is speaking words of eternal life, and the only thing that he's interested in is getting half of the inheritance. And he's not even listening to the Lord Jesus. He gets up and he says, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. Now look what it says. And he said, verse 14, and he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? This tells me something wonderful about the Lord Jesus. You see, friend, there's coming a day when the Lord Jesus will judge. At the great white throne, we read about it in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11, says, And I saw a great white throne. And he that sat upon it, from whose face the heavens and the earth fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and so on. There's coming a day when the the, the Lord Jesus will be the judge. But the Lord speaks to this man. Look what he says. He says, man, who made me a judge or divider over you? He said, look, I haven't come to judge. I've come to save. That's what the little course says. He did not come to judge the world. He did not come to blame. He did not only come to seek. It was to see if he came. And you see, here's this farmer's son. 
And he feels that he's lost out and the brothers took the whole inheritance and I've got nothing left. And he's sitting in a meeting and the Lord Jesus is preaching words of eternal life. And the only thing he's thinking about is getting his hands on half of his inheritance. And what I tell you, friends, he's going to go to hell. He's going to go to hell. I wonder, is your mind fixed on what the Lord might say to you tonight? Are you thinking about tomorrow? I have to go to work tomorrow and I've got to do this or I've got to do that. And the boss has got it in for me. And, and maybe the children are badly behaved. And maybe there's bills to pay. And you could be so thinking about so many things. But in the meeting tonight, could I plead with you to listen for the voice of God? Listen while the Lord speaks those words of eternal life and grace and forgiveness and salvation to you. Because there's nothing more important in this world than salvation. And this man has stood up in the meeting and he's asked the Lord about the inheritance and the Lord just turns around and he begins to give a parable. And I believe, as I've already said, that the Lord is now talking about this man's father who has died. And this man, this rich man has died and left an inheritance and what he has left is two sons. And they're just fighting over the inheritance and they're as bad as he was. All he could think about in life was money and business and building shades and stuff. And he never sorted out his soul's salvation. And he's left two boys and they're exactly the same. And they're fighting over an inheritance and they're going to go to hell just like their dad. And this man's in a meeting. I believe his brother's there too. And these two boys would need to forget about the inheritance and start thinking about eternity. And friend, you need to think about eternity. You need to think about the Lord Jesus and what he did on the cross for you and, and how he offers salvation and eternal life. Now let's read the parable. This is what I want to talk about for a wee while tonight. Luke chapter 12 and verse 16. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do, I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? We'll end there. And we trust the Lord will bless his word to all our hearts tonight. The first thing I want you to notice in this little parable is the divine assessment. God comes into this man's bedroom at night and God says, thou fool. That's the divine assessment. Now, he's not a fool because he's a farmer. I'm sure there's bound to be a farmer in the meeting tonight. I'm not a farmer's son, but I was brought up on farms, and I've worked on farms, and you, you wouldn't think to look at me that I'm this old, but I'm old enough to have milked cows by hand. Anybody here milk cows by hand before? There's an old fella down there too. He's on it as well. I have milk cows by hand. And I milk cows with one of these old aluminium milking machines, and you have to milk one at a time. Now they can milk about 30 at one time. And I know, dear friends, that this man is not a fool because he's a farmer, because I know farmers and they're not a bit soft. There's no flies on the farmers. And I've worked in farms and I have seen a problem and nobody could sort it out. And the oil farmer came along and the, I was going to say, the, I'll not say what I was going to say anyway. The, the dirt was dropping off him and you'd have thought he hadn't a brain in his head and he's able, listen, he's able just to sort it out. And next thing you walk by his workshop and the sparks are flying out of him. And the welder was going, and he had invented something to solve the problem. And this man, I'll tell you, he's not a fool because he's a farmer. He's not a fool because of his finances, either, because the Lord Jesus describes him as being rich. He was able to make a pound. He was able to get the right price for his turkeys and for his spuds. And, and for whatever he did, he was able to turn a pound. And this man was rich. He wasn't a fool because he was a farmer. And he wasn't a fool because of his finances, and he wasn't a fool because of his future plans. He's got the old head screwed on and he's thinking, well, I'm going to have to build a lot of new sheds here. And you see, he's thinking about the future and he's not a fool because he's thinking about his future plans. You see, friend, this man is a fool because of his failure to see his need. He lived his whole life and he never saw his need that he was a sinner. Never figured it out. 
He never realized that he was born in sin, the same as I was and the same as you were, that he was shaping in iniquity, and that his sin had separated from him from God, and that he was on his way to a lost sinner's hell for all eternity. And it never crossed his mind one single time. He was a fool because he never saw his need. He was a fool because he never sought the Lord. You see, the Bible says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found, and call ye upon him while he is near. And you see, friend, there's a time limit to salvation. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. And this man, he never sought the Lord while he may be found. This night he died in his bed. And he died out of Christ and without a Savior. And he dropped down into the caverns of hell for all eternity. He wasn't a fool because of his, he was a farmer. And he wasn't a fool because of his finances. And he wasn't a fool because of his future plans. He was a fool because of his failure to prepare to meet his God. He never prepared for the great eternity. I don't know what age he was when he died. Let's, let's say he was 70. And he lived 70 years down here. And he's going to live for eternity out in hell. And he never prepared for eternity. That makes him a fool. That's the divine assessment. God comes in and God says, thou fool. Now, his neighbors didn't think he was a fool. The farmers that lived beside him thought he was a very, very wise man. And whatever he did in his fields, his fields always seemed to be better in their fields. And his neighbors didn't think he was a fool. And his customers didn't think he was a fool because he sold the best of produce. But God comes in and God says, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. That's the divine assessment. Now, the Bible tells us a number of things about a fool. And I want you to come with me in your Bible, please, to the book of uh, Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 15. Now, this is why God calls this man a fool. Not because he was a farmer, and I know the farmers work long hours and have to work seven days a week, and sometimes you might think you're a bit foolish to, to be somebody like that, but the farmer's no fool, I'll tell you that. This man is a fool because the Bible says certain things about a fool. Look at Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 15, please. Here's what the Bible says. Proverbs 12, 15 says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. Do you see this rich farmer who's described by God as a fool? The way he was going... The direction he was traveling, he was convinced 100% that he was going the right direction. Look what it says. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. You couldn't have turned him. If you had said to him, sir, look, you're going down this broad road and it's leading to destruction and you'll need to turn from your sins and you'll need to trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he'd have said, I catch yourself on, big fella. That's what he said to you. Because the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. You couldn't have turned him and you couldn't have talked to him. He had a went to his door and said, Sir, do you know that God loves you? And that Christ came to Calvary to die and shed his precious blood, that you could be saved. I'll tell you this, you couldn't talk to him, and you couldn't turn him, and you couldn't touch him either, because the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. He's absolutely convinced he's going the right road. And friend, I'll tell you, the plague of Northern Ireland or Ulster tonight is that it's full of fools who are convinced that the way they're going is right. The way of the fool is right in his own eyes. And I've been at enough doors in Northern Ireland and in the south of Ireland too and told people about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you this, some of them were going to bait you up if they could have. And some of them would throw water around you. And some of them slam the door in your face. And some of them couldn't get you out of their property quick enough because they're convinced that they're going the right road. Some ministers told them, do your best and say your prayers and drop a lock of pound into the box on the way out and you'll be dead on. Dear friend, that's a lie from the pit of hell. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. But you see, this man is a fool, and he's convinced in his own mind and in his own heart that the way he's on is right. He's a fool because of his direction. My friend tonight, what direction are you traveling? There's a singing group in Northern Ireland called Heaven Bound. And most of the people in this building tonight are heaven-bound, not because they're Baptists, no. Because they have trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I wonder what direction you're traveling tonight. Listen again, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. Come to the book of Ecclesiastes, please. It tells us something else about the fool. This is why the Lord describes this man as a fool. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verse 14. 
Ecclesiastes 2.14 says that the, the eyes of a wise man are in his head. That's a queer place for your eyes, isn't it? There wouldn't be much use in your pocket. But the Bible says this, anyhow, the, the, eyes man, the, the wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness. This man was a fool because of his direction. He was going the wrong direction, but you couldn't have turned him. But he's a fool because of his darkness, because the fool walketh in darkness. You see, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4, it says that the God of this world, it's a small g in your Bible. In other words, it's not God, it's the devil. The God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not. And here's this man, and his mind has been so blinded, and he's been so bluffed that he's walking in darkness, and God says he's a fool. Now, here's what the Lord Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 19. The Lord Jesus said, and this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And you can see this man's a fool because of his darkness. And you see, the light has come into the world, but he doesn't want the light, no. His deeds are evil. He doesn't want his neighbors to see what he's at. He doesn't want anybody to see his secret life, so he just stays in the darkness. And he's there because of choice. Men love darkness rather than light. And dear friend, tonight, if you're still in the darkness and if you're still in that way that leadeth to destruction, you're there because you want to be there. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And this man's a fool because of his darkness. The Lord Jesus came into the world and in John chapter 8 and verse 12, he said, I am the light of the world. You see, the light has come into the world. And at the place called Calvary, God switched on the light of his wonderful, wonderful love. Remember what it says in John chapter 3 and verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And, and God switched on the light of his love at Calvary. I think the three crosses are up there. and That's where God switched on the light of his love, so that you might see that God loves me. Oh, that Christ loved me so much that he, that he died on the cross and shed his precious blood. Remember what it says in Romans 5 and verse 8, but God commendeth his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Oh, friend, can you see the light of God's love? Can you see the light of God's grace? The Bible says in Titus 2 verse 11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. And God has switched on the light of his grace. Oh, there's grace enough to save you. There's love enough to reach you. There's mercy enough to save you and lift you out of the sin that you're in. Ephesians 2 verse 4 says, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, were with thee, loved us. And in spite of the fact that God has switched on the light of love and grace and mercy, the fools in this world are still walking in darkness. Because here's what the Bible says. It says the fool walketh in darkness. He's a fool because of his direction. And he's a fool because of his darkness, but he's a fool because of his decision. Now, come to Psalm 53 and verse 1. Psalm 53 and verse 1. And you can see why God called this man a fool. Because of his direction, he's going on the broad road that leadeth to destruction. And because of his darkness, he has decided to just to stay in the dark. But you can see his declaration or his decision, whatever you want to call it, Psalm 53 and verse 1. I want you to notice carefully in your Bible how it's written. It says, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Now, this man is not that stupid to think that there's no God. I don't think any farmer could really be an atheist. A farmer who goes out into a field with half a hundred weight, that's four stone, 25 kilograms that is. 25 kilograms of barley and throws it out over the field. And he goes out in a wind a month's time and he brings in about 25 ton. There's no way that happened by accident. This man is not that stupid that he thinks there's no God. Look what it says. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. The little words there is are in italics. And that tells me that the translators put them in there just to make it read a bit better. But what the fool really said is no God. God spoke to him. He said no God. God called him. He said no God. God offered him salvation. He said no God. And he's a fool because of his direction. He's on the wrong road, but you couldn't turn him. And he's a fool because of his darkness. He's walking in darkness. And he's a fool because of his decision. He said no to God. And that's the divine assessment on this man. 
I wonder, dear friend, what the divine assessment is on you tonight. I would never shake your hand at the door and say, look, you're a fool. You'd probably slap me in the teeth if I did that. But dear friend, I'll tell you, God's looking down on your life. And if you haven't got Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you're still going on that broad road that leadeth to destruction and you're still living in darkness and you've still said no to God, then the divine assessment is that you're a fool. You're on your way to hell and you could be on your way to heaven tonight. Now look at the verses again. Look chapter 12 and verse 20. I want you to see not just the divine assessment, but I want you to notice very quickly the divine appointment. Look what it says. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night, this night, thy soul shall be required of thee. God's moving from the divine assessment. He says, Thou fool, to the divine appointment. This man has a divine appointment, and it's going to be this very night, this night he's going to die. He's going to get ready for bed. He's going to uh, eat a bit of toast or whatever he does. And he's going to go down and he's going to go into the bedroom and he's going to die. Divine appointment. Wouldn't matter if there's 3,000 doctors in the house. It wouldn't matter if all the nurses was there. It wouldn't matter if them all the, the monitors on him and all the tubes on him and all the lines that they put in. It wouldn't matter too hooch. This man's going to die tonight. Divine appointment. Now look at verse 17. I want you to see this man here. It says, and he, and he thought within himself. He's a thinker. He's, he's not a, a clown. He's a thinker. He, he's thinking the thing through. And I want you to see what he's thinking about. He's going to die tonight, but he's thinking about something else. It says, and he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room to, where to bestow my fruits. He's thinking about his predicament. He's got a big bumper harvest and the wee barn that he has isn't big enough to howl it. And he's saying, what am I going to do now? He's, he's got an agricultural problem and he's thinking about his predicament. Look at the next verse. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. He's thinking about his advancement now. He's thinking about his commercial project what i'll do I'll, I'll i'll get a couple of contractors and price them off one another this is what they do and i'll get the best price i can for the biggest barn i can and this will sort my problem out he's thinking about his predicament and he's thinking about his advancement and then look at verse 19 and i will say to my soul soul thou hast much goods laid up for many years take thine ease eat drink and be merry this is a social plan he's thinking about his retirement and there's nothing wrong about thinking about your retirement. And he's thinking about his predicament and he's thinking about his advancement, but he never thought about his appointment. Never did. It never crossed his mind that one day he's going to die. And God comes in, you see, and he's thinking about his predicament. What am I going to do with this big harvest? And I'm thinking about my advancement. I'm going to get a price tomorrow morning. I'm going to get a barn built up. And I'm thinking about my retirement. And I'm going to put my feet up. And I'm going to let them two cubs of mine do all the work. And I'm just going to lie back and enjoy myself. But he never thought about his appointment. And that's why God said he's a fool. You see, friend, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. What about the appointment? What about the judgment? Dear friend, have you given any thought whatsoever to that divine appointment? That day, somewhere in the future, maybe not that far away, when God says, that's it. I'm bringing you out. You're coming out of time and you're coming into eternity. It's going to happen to us all if the Lord Jesus doesn't come. And you may be thinking, well, you know, I'm only 30 or I'm only 35 or I'm only 25. I've been to enough funerals of young people and you've been the same. You don't have to be 70 to die. And we're not told what age this man was. He might only have been 43. I've been at a farmer's funeral. He was only 43. In fact, there's a farmer down from our hometown, 50, 52 last Sunday who died, or last Monday. You see, dear friend, have you ever thought about the appointment? You've maybe thought about your retirement and you've got a good old pension with legal in general or some of them boys that's robbing you anyway, likely. And you've thought about the retirement, but you've never thought about the appointment. 
Would you not think for a minute or two about that appointment, that moment, when your heart will stop beating and your lungs will stop breathing and you're going to be absent from the body and you're going to be out into eternity? Think about the appointment. You can see the divine assessment. The time is gone. I want to just finish here. I want you to look at verse 20 again. You can see the divine assessment and you can see the divine appointment. I want you to see the divine accountant. Look what it says in verse 20. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee then. Who shall those things be which thou hast provided? He says to the man, God says to the man, Do you see all those things? that you're thinking about that barn and that barley and, uh, and that tractor and that plow and that field and, and all, see all the things that you're thinking about. God says, look, you're going to leave all those things behind you. Look what it says, then who shall those things be? The Bible says in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 7, it says, for we brought nothing into this world and will take nothing out of this world. And all the things that are occupying his mind. And all the things that have occupied his life and, and kept him away from the Lord Jesus Christ. Every one of them is going to be left behind. And one morning his two sons, I believe he had two sons that are in the passage. And he usually had them up out of bed maybe at four o'clock in the morning. You know how it is? And this morning they got to lie in and they, they got up and they said, The old boy hasn't come down much wrong. And they went up the hall, you see, and they battered the door of his bedroom, and they opened it up, and there he's lying, cold, dead. God has come and taken him out into eternity. And you see, they're starting to wonder about all the things he has left behind, but the thing that he couldn't leave behind, his soul, it's out in a lost sinner's hell. My dear friend, what about the thing that you cannot leave behind? You see, the Bible says in Mark chapter 8 and verse 36, I think it is, What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What, what's it going to cost, dear friend, if you go out into eternity without Jesus Christ? This man, you can see the divine assessment. God says he's a fool because he hasn't got Christ. And you can see the divine appointment. This night thy soul shall be required of thee. You can see the divine accountant. Then who shall those things be? Now I want you to notice something. This man died at harvest time. It's harvest time, isn't it? And it's possible to die at harvest time. He didn't think he was going to die. He was planning to build big sheds at the the, the farm and, and get a, a, a pension plan going. But he died at harvest time. You notice in verse 20 that he also died at night time. This night thy soul shall be required of thee. And my dear friend, if I wasn't saved at this harvest time and this night time, I wouldn't be going to my bed until I have Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Think about the harvest time. Think about the night time. And this man went out into eternity at harvest time. And he went out into eternity at night time. And God said he was a fool because he went without Christ. My dear friend, don't go into eternity without Christ. There's maybe something you have to give up. There's maybe something that you think you couldn't do without. Well, if you go down into hell, the thing you'll hit the most is the thing that stopped you from coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't let anything stop you from coming to put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless his word to your hearts tonight.